Good morning, everybody. Would you stand, please? This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. I give thanks. Give thanks for all you have done. I will sing of your mercy and your You brought me out, you set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand, you are my God, your faithfulness, my solid rock. I give thanks, I give thanks for all you have done. I will sing of your mercy and your love, your love is unfailing. we lift our hands the heavens open heavens open so let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us and as we lift our hands the heavens open heavens open so let It is great to be here to worship the Lord together. Thanks for coming out today. Hey, we have a few things that we want to update you on. One is that if you're new to faith, if you're a visitor here today or new, we would love for you to go to our website, faithcrossroads.org, and to our connection page there and fill that out. Let us know you're here. Let us know you're new, and we will follow up with you, but we'd love to get to know you. Secondly, Dave and Jean Cossey, are they here this morning? Jean is over there. She's 50 this weekend. I'm sorry, 50th anniversary this weekend. They've been around a good while here, so congratulations. There are offering boxes on each of the tables, and um, so if you want to stop by there and, and drop your offering there, you can always do that online, too, on our giving page. So just... Uh, Go to our website and you can find it there. We are so grateful for all that you're doing to help out with the, the tents here and to help out uh, missionary salaries in July are always a challenge. So thank you for your faithful giving. The tents, we are here through August 30th. So that 
I had a couple people asking me this morning, and I said, oh, stay tuned. You'll find out. Um, but we are in the tents through August 30th, so we will be back in the building September 6th. So enjoy the summer out here, and we decided to do that so we don't have the number issues and some of those other uh, restraints. So enjoy being out here. And then also, you have communion today, so if you don't have these, there will be some elders walking around. But remember, to get them open, the wafer is on the top, just the clear cellophane. Yeah, if you raise your hand, Steve's walking around with those. We have a couple of elders. So just the clear cellophane gets the wafer. And then... Finally, as we look at this morning, Vacation Bible School. What a great week we had. I was here Friday and, and seeing some of the folks come through on the reverse parade we had. We want to look at um, some of the information I got about Vacation Bible School. We had 114 kits go out. That means 114 students that were participating. We had 58 families participating in this. 78 volunteers involved in helping either with participating in the videos um, handing things out, doing all the things. The teenagers made up a third of those volunteers. Isn't that great? So we had a lot of great things that were saying. I was one, one comment was said, I was blown away by the video yesterday. So, so good. I cannot wait to watch today's. The kids, the students really had a blast, and the spotlight video was almost emotional to see friends we haven't seen for so long. It was very special. So, but it's not over. If you missed that and you couldn't participate, we have extra kits and the videos are up on our website for another month. So if you want to participate, you want to run it somewhere at your home or a friend's, just contact the office and they'll help you do that. All right? We come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, our Savior, Messiah, Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, Lamb of God, Alpha and Omega, and the King of Kings. Let's raise our voices to him. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what a sacrifice was made as the heavens rose sky lit up a flash of light breaking through when all was lost he crossed eternity the king of life was on the move amen or in a dark cold tomb where our Lord was laid one miraculous 
precious breath And we're forever changed All hail! All hail King Jesus All hail the Lord of heaven and earth All hail King Jesus All hail the Savior
How many of us know that Jesus is Lord? He's on the throne. Amen. That's right. Sing it from heaven. From heaven you can hear. I know you're drawing near as I worship. But I will stay here I lift my hands to heaven Hear my heart surrender I tell my soul again You are Lord of all And though the seas are raging You will speak and tame them And you I find my rest you are in control. Through valleys I will trust. Your spirit is enough to keep me walking. You guide my every step. Speak life to me again. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. I lift my hands to heaven. Hear my heart surrender. Tell my soul again, you are Lord of all. Though the seas are raging, you will 
speak and tame them. You, I find my rest. You are in control. You are in control. I will trust. I will trust in only you. No one can add to your perfection. You're the beginning and the end. More than I can comprehend. There is no one like you, no one. I will trust in only Yes, Lord, you are in control, Lord Jesus, today. And I just pray, Lord, that today each one of us would understand that in our own lives, Lord, that we would cling to you, Lord, with everything that we have, Lord. We would draw strength from you, Lord. When we're weak, we know you're strong, Lord. We serve a God who's able more than able to do exceedingly above what we can ever imagine or hope. You, you are for us, therefore who can be against us? That's why we stand on this field and we say, it is well with my soul. Put aside all of the technical issues, we know that you're still Lord. You're still God above all. Worthy to be praised adored just even as the, the breeze runs through this tent I think of, of how refreshing it is to worship you Lord how refreshing it is to be in your presence together knowing that you are Lord and God that you have a, us in mind you seek a relationship with us, Lord. And when we stray, I pray, Lord, that we come back to you. Even as, even now, Lord, that we would come to you, Lord, with our everything, our future. Put our lives in your hands, Lord, today. From the youngest today to the oldest, Lord, trust in you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Good morning, church. I'm John. I'm the student ministries director here at Faith Baptist. It's my pleasure to open the word with you this morning. Uh, if you want to take your Bibles or 
iPads, whatever you're using to look at God's Word, and turn with me to Luke chapter 18. That's where we'll be at today, is in Luke chapter 18. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. The title of my message is Praying to God Who Knows All and Loves You. And we find in this parable this. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they should always ought to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Verse 3 says, And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will he not give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's what we're looking at today, and join me with me in prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for your word, that it does not return empty, We thank you for the parables that it gets us to think and think creatively wise, Um, Lord, what your word has to say. And we just thank you again uh, that we can worship you in spirit and truth this morning. Help us not just to be hearers of the word, but also doers. Help us to be active listeners and to understand the word and to receive it eagerly um, as it has the power not only to change lives, but especially our own life. We thank you again for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. This context is interesting because it's a chapter surrounded by a two-way conversation between Jesus and his disciples in Luke chapter 18 as he heads back to Jerusalem. On the way, Jesus tells them a series of parables to comfort them that they may not lose heart as they pray. That's mentioned in verse 1, which is key to understanding uh, this lesson is this idea of losing, not losing heart and also praying, and the persistence that we should have there. Maybe for some of you, you're familiar with parables. Maybe for others, you're not. Just as a word of review, parables and what they are, they're a familiar communication of truth. Uh, It was common in that day for rabbis to explain the law of God through parables. It creates connections with individuals through fictional characters and helps us understand and see ourselves in relation to others and God. They are also timeless Yes, as much as customs have changed and maybe the culture from a farming community to now has changed, the truth in those parables have not. And the other thing that's interesting is that these are veiled truths to those who did not recognize who Jesus was. They would be blind to the truth because of their sin and would only view them as weird stories. Matthew chapter 13 verses 11 through 17 talks about how that's a fulfillment from the scriptures and how Jesus was a source of the interpretation of these parables. So, I find it personally amazing in verse 1. Let me read it to you. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I find it amazing that Jesus is so concerned with his disciples uh, when he already had enough to think about on his plate. And a matter of fact, a week or less, he would be crucified Uh, and become the sin sacrifice for us, and be momentarily separated from uh, the closest friendship that anyone has ever had with the Father and the fellowship that he had there. With thoughts like that about him becoming the sin sacrifice, uh, he could have been more focused about those things, but instead he turns to comforting his disciples, which I find amazing. A lot of times when we think about sharing the gospel, we look for an opportunity, but sometimes that perfect opportunity isn't exactly the best opportunity or the best time to share. A lot of times it's because we're going from uh, location A to location B, or maybe something's going on in our lives that needs our attention. But Jesus shares these words of comfort when he had so much going on in his plate, and I'm so glad he did because this parable is crucial to us understanding how God works and how we can be persistent in our prayers. So the second thing that I want to turn our attention to is meeting the characters. Let's look at it in verse 2 of Luke chapter 18. 
Jesus said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. This is really interesting. Uh, Parables always have this type of twist to them where there's something that's going wrong a lot of times. Um, And Jesus uses that as an explanation to talk about what the kingdom of heaven is like or who God is or how his disciples should follow. And so we meet this judge. And uh, in my uninspired chapter titles, it says the unjust judge, uh, which is an oxymoron in itself. It's like a youth pastor who doesn't like teens, or a teacher who doesn't teach, or a worship pastor who can't do worship. Uh, Whatever it comes down to, this is an oxymoron in itself, and he didn't fear the two most important things that he was charged to do, which is ultimately to keep the law before God himself, but also to respect his fellow man. And he doesn't care about any of those things. Uh, I'm sure if we were a plaintiff in a lawsuit, we would be looking for somewhere else Uh, to get our justice done. But we are introduced in verse 3 to the specific person. In verse 3 it says, And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. How he uses the word widow is really interesting, and it reminds me of James chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, Pure and undefiled religion is this, to care for the orphan and widow. And orphans and widows, uh, especially in that culture, really had nothing to give or nothing to gain. Uh, They were the outcasts of that society, especially in a patriarchal, family-based system. A widow whose husband had died and has no uh, kids to take care of her, she was financially destitute. So it talks about in the Old Testament that he charged Israel to take care of these people, but a lot of times they're not cared for. And I'm sure a lot of times in churches, as much as Christians, we're charged to take care of these according to James chapter 1, verse 27. A lot of times they fall through our cracks. And to Jesus' mind, he understands this widow. He understands what this widow is going through. And he has incredible compassion. And he also has incredible understanding of this story and and the widow's need. Uh, The need is to give me justice against my adversary. Uh, This parable is only eight verses long, and I would love to know what the specific justice she's looking for and what was the adversary's problem against her. We don't have that. It it could have been the adversary was responsible for maybe even killing her husband or maybe forcing her out of her house or maybe it was some other type of legal or trade dispute. We just don't know, and the mind starts to wander. But we've all been at that point where we've been a victim, And I know a lot of times we don't like to use that word victim, but she truly is a victim. And when you see that she needs needs peace, she needs justice, and we're looking at an unjust judge, we see a collision course of we probably think we know what's going to happen. This judge isn't going to hear the case or give her the time of day. But notice what it says here. It says, who kept, she kept, the widow kept coming to the judge and saying, give me justice. She was persistent. And that's something that unfortunately gets lost in this story is the persistence that, that, that's there. So I want to even rename my chapter or uh, the title of my sermon to Persistent Praying to God Who Knows All and Loves You. Persistence is a key and persistence is what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples here is that you need to be desistent, or persistent in talking to me which is a huge thing that is often overlooked because in our prayers, I know for me, it's a passive thing. I I pray for my food or I pray to open the church service or I pray as I go to bed. But this idea of persistence is kind of what it talks about in 1 1 Thessalonians 5, that we should pray without ceasing. It's an incredible promise that we have here that we are able to go, go boldly before the throne of grace and ask in time of need. need. It talks about in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And it's so incredible to think that we have a God who knows all, loves all. He is that judge. He's a perfect judge, though. He cares about his holiness, and he also cares about humanity. He's not like this unjust judge who doesn't care about anything and can just let everything rot. But rather, he cares for the orphan and widow. He cares also for me and you. So notice what happens here as the, we meet the characters. Notice what happens in verse 4 as far as this whole 
story in this parable uh, gives way to. Verse 4 says, For a while he, referring to the, the judge, refused. But afterward he said to himself, notice he has a, a change of heart, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. That's such a turning point here. We see these two uncontrollable forces meeting and, and this unjust judge finally breaking down. And, and not because he had a change of heart that he should actually fulfill his duty and his calling, but because of what the widow was doing. Every morning and every night uh, before he would go to his chambers or before he would go to his location where he would preside over the cases, that widow was there to greet him and to say, give me justice against my adversary. And as he would check out and head home every night, that widow would be there to greet him again, saying, give me justice against my adversary. Jesus likens this to prayer. A lot of times we just pray on, pray on special occasions or we do an SOS prayer that uh, right before something big happens, like a car accident or right before a graduation or some type of a momentous occasion. But even in the small things, God challenges us that we should be talking to him. E.M. Bounds has a whole bunch of great things to say about prayer. One of the things that particularly strikes me in prayer is that he says prayer is the spiritual oxygen of our life. When I think about that quote, prayer is the spiritual oxygen of our life, I think how many times I'm dying because of asphyxiation or how many times we aren't just breathing because we're not talking to God. God wants to hear from us. It doesn't have to be a magnificent prayer. It doesn't have to be full with all of the theological words that you have in your dictionary. It doesn't have to look like my prayer or Pastor Bob's prayer or an elder's prayer. It has to come from your heart. It has to come from your own, your own walk with God. Maybe for some of you this morning, you don't have your own walk with God. Maybe when you pray, it's, it's much like the prayers are bouncing off the ceiling because you don't have a relationship with God. I would encourage you and challenge you to see God as not some unjust judge, but he is a loving God. He is a, a loving and holy judge, and he is a good father. He's a father to the fatherless. And because of that, we can have hope that as much as we may not feel like our prayers are being answered or as much as the good guys are losing and the bad guys are winning, at the end of the day, he is the one that knows the beginning from the end and we can have hope in him. Not like a hope that we cross our fingers and that we hope we get a good grade or not like a hope that uh, something will happen even though we don't truly deserve it. This hope is, is based on the character of God alone. He is the one that set it into motion. And there's one thing that God cannot do, and that is specifically in James, he cannot lie, with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. We serve an incredible God who is omnipotent, omniscient, ever-present, all-knowing, holy, just, gracious, merciful, caring. Even before we know how to pray, it talks about in Romans, that the Holy Spirit works and intercedes in our life to give us the words that we need in order to call God our Abba Father. This throne of grace that we have, we serve such a high and mighty God that um, is truly not constrained by time, not constrained by a deadline or just the, the fervor of our need, but he does everything according to his good pleasure. And we're part of his good pleasure. He's a just and good judge. He's a just and good father. So, getting back to the unjust judge. He finally recants and he helps this widow. And it says that uh, this widow continues to bother me. Much like maybe for some of us, uh, we have kids that continue to ask us why questions. Or maybe we were those kids that would ask why questions or can I play this game now, or can I do this now, or can I have this for Christmas, or can I have this right now? I know that Toys R Us being gone is, is a sad time for, for kids because you used to line up those aisles and figure out what you wanted, but Amazon does the trick as well, right? 
When it comes down to it, this judge, he turns away from his position and he says, I will defend and protect her lest she continually wear me out. This word wearing me out is not just something that we have when we unplug at the end of the day and our kids are finally in bed whenever that is. But rather this wear me out in the Greek has this idea of blackening one's eye, bruising one's eye. In other words, he couldn't see straight anymore. He was hindered by her continual persistence of her continually coming, which is incredible. So hear the verdict in verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8, it says, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? This is where this parable now goes from an earthly story to an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, an incredible meaning. He says basically this, that if God is just and he follows his word and he understands and loves us, will he not answer our prayers? Now maybe for some of us, we've been praying for a long time. Maybe about someone's salvation, maybe about our own health or loved one's health, maybe forgiveness because we've been trespassed against. And for a lot of us, we may think and we see God as that unjust judge. He's not. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture that's found in Matthew to talk about that. Matthew chapter um, 7, verses 9 through 11. Let me read that to you in Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount We've been going as a junior and senior high through uh, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes. It's an interesting sermon because unlike my message, uh, this sermon is basically you can read it word for word and it would take you about seven minutes. But this is the kingdom principles that Jesus is laying down and he wants us to get a glimpse as far as who God is and what he's done. Verse 7 of Matthew chapter 7 says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or which one of you, if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who love him? Let me read verse 9 one more time, just so it sits with us as far as the good nature of God. Which one of you, if he asks his son, if his son asks him for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will he give him a serpent? So maybe for some of us as dads, I know for me, I do like to play my own version of practical jokes on my kids a lot of times. Uh, You can ask my kids about that, about things that they've... um, had to endure patiently because of me. But at the end of the day, if they're asking because they need something, I'm going to try to do my due diligence to provide for them. And it's very embarrassing when I'm not able to provide for their needs. By the grace of God, I haven't faced that too many times. But we have God the Father. And I know for some of us, we cringe when we hear that word Father because for some of us, we never had a father or we had an absent father. Maybe for some of us, we mourn the loss of our fathers and how good they were to us. They pale in in comparison to the earthly fathers that we've had is the greatness of God the Father. He doesn't want to play some type of practical joke on us. He is not some type of unjust judge. He is not a father that that has just left this universe spinning and is one day just going to fall apart. But rather, he is actively intimately and personally involved with her life. He's a great father. And the word father does not do enough justice, but if we truly understood father the way that that Jesus uses father in these verses, we would truly understand that we have someone who is by our side, who is advocating for us, who is protecting us, who is helping us. Even before we have the words to pray for, he knows what we need. And that's an incredible aspect of the grace grace of God. Let's turn back to Luke as we finish there in Luke chapter 18. 
Let me reiterate verse 7. It says, And will not God give justice to his elect? Justice is a really interesting word right now. Uh, I'm sure I could defend both sides of the political spectrum by definitions of justice. When I initially encountered these verses, uh, I was actually asked to speak um, out of the blue 10 years ago when I was a youth director in New Jersey. And uh, what had happened is the pastor's uh, daughter was, was falling sick to cancer. She got diagnosed, and within a year, uh, she went home to be with God. And on that Sunday morning, I remember 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, and the service started at 9.30, that I got that call to fill in for him. And I had just read these verses in Luke chapter 18, and, and I was so touched and so profound because the church we came from was a small church. We treated one another as family, and we just didn't understand why would God allow bad things to happen to good people. And at the end of the day, we don't know the purpose a lot of times in our pain, but we do know that the effects of our pain can bring us closer to God. And I was able to share with them these verses, and it, it helped me as well to understand that God is not some type of unjust judge. No, he's a righteous, and he's a good judge. Even when we may not like the verdict, maybe it leaves a sour taste in our mouths because of, of us being on that fault side of his verdict. But we, as Christ followers, know that we stood guilty and accused bound for an eternity in a real place called hell that we would not want to wish upon anyone. But God, who is rich in grace and mercy, has given us Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became the sin sacrifice for us, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And because of that, we have a newness of life. We, have, we are being made into this new creation that is very much like Jesus. Those are incredible promises that despite the feelings or despite things happening, no one can take away. So that's what justice looked like for me. But also at the time of this recording, justice is being thrown around a lot. Uh, there is one commentator that had a lot to say about this passage. Uh, his name is Thebede Anya Bewile. Uh, and he says about Luke, he says, the parable repeatedly mentions justice. For several years, we have heard so much about justice. We have witnessed so many pleas and demonstrations for justice. And he doesn't negate those things. He doesn't belittle those things. But this is what he calls to our attention to in this text. But our text reveals the connections between the prayers of the elect and the answer of justice from God. The surest way to get justice is by falling on our knees with heads bowed. When justice comes, it will be perfect, proportionate, and balanced. We truly see chaos that is reckoning to Judges chapter 2, verse 15, where everybody does what is right in their own eyes. But God is not the author of chaos. And there is coming a day that he will judge both the living and the dead, both the righteous and the unrighteous. He will make those wrongs that have angered us, that have uh, made us plea in prayer for God to come and save. He will make those things right. That does not mean that we simply sit back and watch the world burn. But that does mean that at the start of our search for justice and our loved one's search for justice, we pray. Even when we don't understand what we're praying for, this type of justice, we pray to God because he is the author of justice. He is the one that knows about our rights and legal obligations is another word for justice. He knew exactly what that widow needed in her time, forgive me justice against my adversary. Do we trust him that he is the author of justice? And because of that, we can pray because like we said, Prayer is the spiritual oxygen of our life. And how many of us aren't breathing this morning? Or Ian Bounds says it this way too, the moment that we decide not to pray is the moment that we think that we can handle things on our own. And that's truly not the case. I'm a huge fan of uh, nonfiction Christian literature. And uh, I, I love Lord of the Rings. But I also love the Chronicles of Narnia. 
And this caught my attention to talk about this passage. It says this, as Diggory is talking to Aslan. It says, Diggory says, but please, please, won't you? Can't you give me something that will cure my mother? Up until then, he had been looking at the lion, referring to Aslan's great uh, front feet and his huge claws on them. Now in his despair, he looked up at its face. When what he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life. For the tawny face was bent down near his own. And wonder of wonders, great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big tears compared to Diggory's own that for a moment Diggory felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. This is what Aslan's response is. My son, my son, said Aslan, I know. Grief is great. Only you and I in this land of Narnia, he's referring to, Know that yet. Let us be good to one another. God cares a lot about the evil and the injustices that are happening in this world. But he also cares that we don't lose heart in it all. And I've been guilty with that by just watching the endless news cycle and Twitter feeds that are on there. And it doesn't mean that we just throw away and break away our TVs or delete Twitter, although maybe for some of us that may help. But what it does mean is that when we feel that way, when we feel that we're losing heart and we're giving up, those are the moments that we need to pray without ceasing. Pray to a God who knows the beginning from the end, to a God who is not done with us yet, and to a God that will one day make this new creation that, that creation groans for. Would you pray with me as we close? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this time that we can just look at the persistence in praying to you who knows and loves all. And Lord, some of us have heavy burdens on our heart, whether health, whether family, whether our own walk with you. Lord, you know. And we're so thankful that we can cast our anxieties and our cares to you for you care for us. Lord, help that scripture not just to be something that we learned in youth group or Awana or some time ago, but help us to understand that, Lord, you are greater than Aslan. And we thank you for that picture, that, Lord, you sympathize with our weaknesses and our hurts and the sin and the evil. You have not left this world spinning to go out of control, but, Lord, there is coming a day, and, Lord, that day has come by the, the, the sending of your Son, Christ the righteous, who has given us life, and has given us life more abundantly. But we understand, Lord, that there are some that do not follow Christ, or some that may be Christian in name that, that Lord, are not Christ followers. So we just please pray that we would, Lord, share the hope of the gospel. We would be persistent in not losing heart, and knowing that, Lord, there is, there is a bigger and better day coming. Lord, help us to take advantage of the opportunities that you've placed us in, whether it's at school or work or even here at church. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to minister. And Lord, help us to be persistent like that widow in our prayers and in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.